as a vast army of greenskins emerged from the tunnels across the large hall, Lord Duragar marshaled his forces in a defensive position. The enemy was not supposed to be found until a day or two, but the dwarves were prepared nonetheless. As the dwarf warriors formed an impenetrable shield wall around the perimeter, master engineers rushed to position the war machines that were being transported into place. They would unleash their fury on the Grobby, the filthy monsters that had dared to come in their way. A time-honored catapult began doing its work. The ancient war machine hurled massive boulders, flying against the approaching greenskin horde, each impact making bloody pulps and creating holes in their pitiful and inorganized vance. Many of them fell, but as it was to be expected when facing the numberless greenskin hordes, the savage ones continued their advance nonetheless. Suddenly, the closest orcs fell as the bolts and bullets shot by dwarf crossbows and handguns found their marks. They were now within range of their deadly and well-crafted weapons, carried by trained warriors, all ready with old grudges upon their lips. This throng had added newer devices to their arsenal, flame-spewing cannons and multi-barreled field guns. They opened fire and roared again and again, burning and smashing dozens of greenskin scum at a time. Dwarf Thunderers continued to fire, unleashing resounding fury and clouds of gun smoke. Being methodical in their engagements, the dwarves continued to load and aim in a disciplined manner, each shot being fired with the same precision as the last, never losing their temper. Thinned and bloodied, the enemy reached the dwarf front lines to confront the shield wall. There, faced with shield, axe and hammer, the greenskins met their end at the hands of the wrathful dwarves. Many orcs and goblins continued to throw themselves with rage against the shield wall, stepping over their own dead. The close combat was bloody, but clearly one-sided. Against the red-hot vengeance of the dwarves, few can stand for long. The greenskins lost their momentum and began to panic. Then finally, the dwarves charged with a deafening war cry, led by Lord Doragar himself. The orcs, goblins, and other foul creatures were in disarray as the dwarves sung the songs of Valea, Grimnir, and Grungni as they slew left and right. The warriors' fury was too much for the greenskins, and the back of the horde was broken in a matter of minutes. With the orcs and goblins not being able to do anything about it, they were going to pay for their trespass with blood, for the dwarves do not forget their grudges. In the earliest stages of their days, the Dawi, as the dwarves call themselves in their own language, were cave dwellers who fashioned primitive tools from flint and eked out a living in the bleak and inhospitable mountains. Then, as now, the dwarves were a hardy folk, and they endured despite the hardships. Led by their gods themselves, the dwarf civilization soon developed from a stone era into a bold new age, with iron and then steel, weapons and armor that Grungni taught them to make. The dwarves were able to fight off the terrors of the mountains and expand into new uncharted territory. Grungni is the dwarf ancestor god of mines and artisans, the father of the dwarf race. And with his guidance, they grew and their civilization thrived. Then tragedy struck as the earth and the sky tore the very mountains apart and the coming of chaos into the world pitched the dwarf race against the demons of the warp. Since then, one calamity after another has assailed the Dawi, 
with only some respite between great wars and crisis. The War of Vengeance and the Time of Woes, both terrible events for their race, proved to be a devastating fate for the dwarves. We will explore more of these events in their own videos, but the dwarves have endured against the odds, not without paying an enormous price for their right to live though. Now they struggle to survive, assailed by all sides, waging wars on a thousand fronts with an ever-thinning line of defense. Contact between strongholds has been lost. Many outposts and far-flung mine works were collapsed, and many more were assaulted, defending on their own against the encroaching darkness. Skaven, orcs, and goblins, undead legions, chaos minions, and many other unnameable creatures and monsters roam the half-filled ancient strongholds of the dwarves ever looking to feed or conquer at the expense of the noble and ancient race. The dwarves have a tragic history of great disaster after great disaster. Their numbers are a fraction of what they used to be in the days of glory, days long gone. But each calamity, each battle, and each dwarf slain has only served to further steal the resolve of an indomitable race. Although much of the ancient knowledge available to the dwarves has been lost to fires, buried under fallen pillars and debris, flooded, trampled, stolen, or otherwise lost to time, they have managed to outstrip their ancestors in one key aspect engineering. Inventions flourished in the Silver Age, but the Dawi are a conservative folk, and it takes them time to accept new ideas and add them into their everyday life, or ratify its use in the field of battle. Thus, an item's invention can be many generations removed from when it actually becomes acceptable to use it. Weapons of various sizes and mechanisms were devised. Many improvements were made to the already reliable and deadly artillery, and black powder weaponry was available, and many other revolutionary inventions have been engineered by the many clever and talented dwarf engineers. Mining was revolutionized by steam power drilling, taking fewer dwarves to excavate new mines and execute new projects. As the dwarf population is now but a fraction of its former size, these innovations were much needed. Dwarves are a race that take their oaths seriously, so honoring any promises made despite dangers or the passage of time has proven to be a reason for the dwarf craftsmen to have a fierce determination that drive them to attain the pinnacles of engineering and architectural wonder that they realize through the care for their craft, sweat, and sheer perseverance. These master engineers accompany the vengeful throngs into the most hazardous of battlefields, often wielding mechanical warhammers made by themselves, and prototype black powder weaponry such as pistols or rifles, even more powerful than the common hand cannons used by the Thunderer's firing line. Although being well equipped and having the skill to effectively fight, master engineers more often than not stay away from the front lines, preferring instead to coordinate the various pieces of artillery brought to the field, greatly improving their already immense efficiency. It is a rare sight indeed that a dwarf machine of war jams mid-firing or breaks. But when that does happen, if a master engineer is nearby, the dwarf commander can be assured that it will not remain inoperable for long. Master engineers direct and coordinate the construction of barricades, stone walls, and firing pits in quick succession, adapting on the fly as the battle progresses 
and in perfect accordance to the needs of the army fighting in the front lines. The experienced master engineers can tell when an organ gun will need more black powder based on the circumstances or how a ballista is best used to bring down an immense monster with a powerful and precise shot. Amongst the various realms of the dwarves, there are many clans. They take their ancestry as seriously as they take their grudges. Over the centuries, each clan has forged their respective traditions and specializations. Just as it is with clans, guilds do the same for unique skill sets. Their secret handshakes, signatures, and clothing being used to identify members of each guild. Such is the example of the Engineers Guild, one of the most secretive of all dwarf institutions. Being one of the most important organizations in the realm of the dwarves, the Engineers Guild provides it with the latest long line of technological marvels. Most of them are for practical, everyday purposes, such as pumps to keep the mines dry, engines to pull on heavy weights, and steam-powered contraptions to better dig into the earth. Although the guild has a presence on most, if not all, dwarf holdings, its biggest and most magnificent workshops are located in Zufbar, on the banks of the Blackwater Lake. It is where long-beard engineers pass on their knowledge to aspiring students. It is there, too, where the dwarf machines of war are developed, from the humblest wooden ballista to the most advanced gyrocopters. Indeed, the great renown that dwarves have upon the field of battle, especially on siege warfare, is due in great part to the Engineers Guild, whose brilliant minds bring forth their race's hatred into physical manifestations of awesome killing power. As strange as it is, for a guild made up of skilled craftsmen, innovation is something heavily frowned upon by the council of long-bearded elders that make up the guild's leadership. Despite many technological breakthroughs, it is a conservative guild, believing proven methods are best. Innovation is frowned upon, and apprentices are taught that new ideas lead to trouble. Many great inventions are approved for use long after the inventor's death. A portion of young, brilliant, and adventurous minds end up being expelled because the tension between new creations and traditions has caused friction between the often reckless young apprentices and the elder and experimented longbeards, who take a more conservative stance on these matters. Sometimes, however, innovation ends up benefiting the dwarves so much that it is actually praised even as some of the more conservative elders continue to distrust it. Such was the case of the invention of black powder by the dwarves, leading to many great engines of war, such as cannons and organ guns. These weapons turned out to be so effective that the invention was eventually picked up by humans. Black powder-related inventions keep showing up in the realms of man and dwarf to the present day. Of course, virtually all visionary engineers have been expelled at least once, only to be readmitted later on after their insane invention has been proven useful. The contributions that the Engineers Guild has made for their race over the centuries are not to be underestimated. Still, some members who are usually the highest ranked individuals of the guild make themselves known on the battlefield directly. The devastating power many of these war machines have in the field of battle is something to behold. In the next part of this mini-series, we will explore how the artillery of the dwarves is used against the many enemies that assail the stubborn race of fierce warriors and brilliant inventors.
Gyrocopters are marvels of engineering, even compared to other dwarf inventions. Revolutionary in its design in more ways than one, the gyrocopters and variants are one of those inventions who most likely warranted the expulsion of its creator by the conservative elder engineers, only to be reinstated into the guild after the crazy contraption proved its worth, most likely a process that took centuries due to the slow rate at which change is accepted and implemented in the engineers' guild. The very first models of gyrocopters were extremely fragile and very rare, being allocated to trusted members of the Engineers Guild for their own experiments and use. After an extended period of time using this system, most likely several decades, gyrocopters began to be used for rapid communication between holds and small-scale supply drops to besieged dwarf homes and holds. As a result of this, the Everlasting Realm most likely has the quickest and most efficient non-magical communication system between their more established Karaks. A gyrocopter landing pad being one of the very first things to be built in isolated or newly established settlements. It did not take long, in dwarf engineering terms, for gyrocopters to begin being tested for combat purposes and after decades of effective implementations of these flying machines in the battlefields, gyrocopter squadrons are now a mainstay of the vengeful throngs. They have proved to be a great asset in the fields of battle, and effective against a wide array of enemies. It is said that the inventor of the gyrocopter was heavily inspired by watching dragons swooping down from inaccessible mountain crags. All gyrocopter variants work utilizing an ingenious and very lightweight steam engine, developed specifically for this purpose. It powers both the main, upwards-facing rotor, and two or more backwards-facing rotors that are mounted on the wings. Said smaller rotors are used to provide forward thrust, while the bigger one generates lift strong enough to make the entire chassis and whatever equipment it uses airborne. The combination of these two sets of rotors is a flying machine that can take off vertically, hover over a spot, go backwards, forwards, upwards and sideways with immense speed compared to other vehicles. The two sets of rotors and their blades work by accelerating air as a result of its unique angle that, upon being rotated at high speeds by the steam engine, generates an equal and opposite facing force. Couple that with the aerodynamic design of the gyrocopter fuselage, and the resulting interaction of forces can be controlled by a skilled engineer pilot to move the vehicle through the air at high speeds. You and your followers will die! That is my oath, as my kin Grimnir is witness! The main armament of the gyrocopters is the steam gun. A weapon that, upon a specific lever being pulled by the pilot, opens a valve that releases pressure and boiling steam upon the enemy. All gyrocopters are also equipped with one or two highly explosive droppable bombs. They might also be equipped with a brimstone gun, a weapon that spews out hot alchemical fire that was originally developed to be used by the skilled iron drakes in tunnel warfare. Both of these weapons are mounted on the very front, or chin, of the gyrocopter. To protect themselves, they utilize a special lightweight steel alloy, made up of carbon, iron, and aluminium. The rhythmic beating of great rotor blades grew in intensity, until a squadron of gyrocopters passed over it. Not long after came the whistling drop of ordnance, plummeting from on high, followed by a thunderous blast. Then came the hissing of steam guns and the wails of the dying. Our mine was saved. Upon the battlefield, they are mostly used for flanking maneuvers, 
unleashing their cruel and deadly weaponry on the back of tightly packed enemy formations. Another way that they have historically been used is by performing bombing runs, a strategy so effective that a different variety of gyrocopter has been developed to fulfill this specific purpose. Equipped with grudge buster bombs and clatter guns, the gyro bombers can inflict heavy casualties upon the enemy. Gyro bombers are heavily modified gyrocopters made to carry a significant amount of extra weight. An entire new set of rotor blades and two pairs of helium tanks provide extra lift for the machine, allowing it to carry up to eight grudge buster bombs. Aerodynamic canisters full of black powder and other explosives that bounce on impact with the ground, producing one big explosion on its first target, then secondary and tertiary explosions upon hitting the soils again, making for devastating destruction wherever these explosives land. By my oath, it shall not be opened until the grudge is settled. Until the bones of the undead are smashed to powder. Now, Dowie, take up your axes, for the undead will come to face us. They must, or I'll have every tomb, every cursed gravesite scoured from these lands, leaving these fell vampires with no puppets to command. In its chin sits another gun developed specifically for the gyro bomber, named the Clatter Gun. Coupled with its impressive payload, gyro bombers are able to open massive holes in enemy formations, leaving their bodies splattered between charred rubble. Indeed, while being besieged from all sides by orcs, goblins and other vile creatures, there are very little visions that bring more relief than an air wing of gyrocopters and bombers laying down a deadly carpet of bombs, steam, and fire upon the foe. Several air formations have grown famous over the centuries that the Dwarf Air Force has existed, including the renowned Skyhammers from Jufbar and the Black Hammer Bombers of Karaz Akarak. The gyrocopters and gyro bombers are amongst the pinnacle of Dwarven technology, but they are only part of a wider arsenal the Dwarf engineers have developed over the centuries of war, trials, and experiments. The clever Dwarf engineers are always coming up with new and effective ways to deal with the numberless enemies that assail the once mighty Dwarf strongholds. One of the most famous of these engineers was Grim Bullockson. As the son of Guildmaster Burlock Daminson, the upstart master engineer Grim Burlock's son was expected to follow in his father's footsteps. Thanks to his natural talent and ability to learn fast, Grim became the youngest dwarf to pass the multiple tests and rituals required to become a master engineer. His outstanding engineering ability is highly regarded by his peers and even the eldest of master engineers recognize his talent. Grim Burlockson is a gifted and creative inventor. He has devised many useful creations, including weapons and augmentations. When other aspirants were still learning basic principles, he was already mingling with advanced techniques and materials, had already constructed a self-lighting pipe a steam-powered beard braider, and even a double-barreled rifle that could kill half a dozen Groby with a single shot. In addition, he has devised a telescopic sight that better allows him to triangulate his aiming, dramatically improving his accuracy. This sight fits over his battle helm and is regarded by many fellow engineers as a cleverly invented and very useful addition to their arsenal. An eccentric, if somewhat erratic, genius, the inventive engineer torments his guildmates by attempting new designs, questioning past methods, and stubbornly refusing to give up new inventions, while the elder members of the guild consider that he does not value the ancient laws that engineers are expected to follow. 
dwarf engineers are essential to the development and sustainability of the entire dwarf civilization. Being in a seemingly persistent state of war, these war machines are the backbone that keeps the dwarfs standing against otherwise impossible odds. In the next installment of this series, we will study the dwarfs' artillery and their devastating uses. We thank you for watching. A hardy and industrious folk, the dwarves are great artisans and craftsmen, particularly when it comes to metal and stone. These materials are the very things this ancient race values above all else, and their great mountain holds are wrought from them. The dwarves take pride in building and inventing things that are made to last. To use and preserve a device for much time is seen as a form of respect and appreciation for its creator. It is their belief that in doing so, they are venerating their own ancestor gods, who first taught them the arts of craftsmanship and gave rise to their race. There are even devices and pieces of work from the times when Grungni, Velea, and Grimnir walked amongst their people. Items that are still usable and treasured beyond all other riches. It is not rare for many dwarves to travel far distances to visit the famous destinations where these legendary items are safely guarded, or to traverse thousands of miles to mighty holds with the display of architecture, engineering, and overall grandiosity is such that it reminds them of their own golden age, when the dwarves ruled the vast mountain ranges and their race prospered beyond imagination. A few examples of these places include the Shrine of Grimnir at Karak Kadrin, or Slayer's Keep, depending on who one asks. The Stone of Grungni along the Silver Road is another fine example. On the other side of that same coin, many other dwarves travel vast distances and put themselves in harm's way if necessary in order to recover long-lost relics sacred to their race. Many expeditions and even armies have been sent in missions to recover these lost artifacts with varying degrees of success. Many of them have not returned. But these are things that must be done, as no grudge against the dwarves goes unanswered, and the ones that dare to steal their relics cannot be forgiven. With such importance and veneration do the dwarves treat the expertly crafted items they produce in their forges. The highly secretive engineers guild is a vaunted dwarf institution. Though they produce many useful and practical inventions for the general dwarf society, it is the forging of war machines for which they are best known. Many engineers are often found inside their chambers or testing grounds, continually working and adjusting the engineering marvels they are working on before finishing it up and moving on to the next creation. But on occasion, and when necessity demands, these engineers accompany their war machines into the battles they are used in. Their experience in the battlefield and the knowledge of every aspect of the war machines are of tremendous benefit. I see beside me brave dwarfen hearts. Such courage will imbue my rune helm. This is the day to strike many grudges from the Great Book. I want the earth dead. There is no other outlook. Doing the dwarves' work since the days of the ancestor gods, the bolt throwers are tried and true artillery pieces, and many clans still swear by it. A well-placed shot can skewer whole files of enemies, and with their piercing power, they make a mockery of any armor they may be wearing. The bolt throwers are most effective when used against a large monster or heavily armored foe. 
Many wyverns, trolls, and other foul creatures have been victims to the piercing bolt this war machine unleashes. Let us record great deeds this day and give these scum a right royal honoring! For thousands of years it has served the Dawi, and being a reliable and accurate piece of artillery, it will continue to do so until the end of days. Cannons are amongst the most powerful of war machines, and a mainstay of many dwarf throngs across the mountains and beyond. These devastating weapons were originally constructed in Zufbar, and such was its success that now all holds have cannons available, and many of the larger strongholds can make their own. Atop the vast holds and defense towers, many powerful cannons are stationed, forever watching into the darkness, ready to come into life and tear into tightly packed formations, wreaking havoc among the enemy. In addition to the cannons housed within strongholds, many clans maintain a number of cannons that can join a throng on the march, always ready to go to war, where the devastating firepower would be used the most. In the battlefield, they are placed in overlooking positions, ready to open fire upon the most dangerous of enemies, even at long ranges. A cannon can shatter the most heavily armored of foes, pour heavy shots into massed enemy formations, shatter city gates or fortifications, and topple the largest of monsters. This is truly one of the most dangerous of weapons made by dwarven hands. Given the quality of their production, many cannons have been in service for a number of centuries and are highly revered and protected by their crew. But as powerful as these weapons are, they are also somehow unreliable. The slightest crack or premature ignition of black powder can result in a malfunction and permanent damage to the cannon, or even worse, cause devastating accidents to the crew and anyone involved. Even the best forged cannons are subject to occasional malfunction. The deadly flame cannon is used widely within many throngs. This war machine douses foes with a gout of fire and oil, causing panic and confusion within their ranks and burning down the enemies of the dwarves. A just punishment for any enemy foolish enough to defy such an honorable and noble race. There are few weapons in existence that can put fear into the heart of a foe like a flame cannon, one of the deadliest and most effective inventions of the Engineers Guild. A volatile mix of hot oil and molten tar is poured into the flame cannon before air is pumped into the barrel. Soon the pressure inside is increased until the barrel is ready to burst. When the operators are ready to fire, they place a burning oily wad into the nozzle and that action releases the pressure. The deadly mixture catches fire as it whooshes from the barrel in a leaping spurt. The burning oil arcs into the air towards the foes, illuminating all surroundings in bright orange, until eventually it lands in the middle of the enemy army, burning and melting their armor, drowning their shouts and grunts in living flames. Let the Grudge be settled. Let vengeance begin! Ah! When used in situations where more range is needed to reach distant targets, the crew are trained to know exactly how much extra pressure they need to apply and when to release the straining valves. Failing in these calculations can be a fatal mistake for the crew and anyone in proximity. The flame cannons are dangerous machines 
for both parties, if not used well. Another notable invention from the Engineers Guild is the organ gun. It is called this because the war machine has a resemblance of the pipes on a musical organ. This deadly weapon can be extremely useful when dealing with numerous enemies. The barrels used in this artillery piece are smaller and lighter than an ordinary cannon that is built to fire a single massive shot. In this instance, the barrels are arranged and aligned in such a manner that with a well-timed shot and all its barrels firing to maximum effect at the same time, an organ gun can shatter entire enemy units in seconds. It lacks the range and the stopping power of other war machines, but placed in the right hands, it can decide the fate of a battle, as it has already for hundreds of years of war. Being one of the earliest war machines to be produced en masse by the dwarves, the catapults and grudge throwers are some of the most venerated and well-used war machines by the Dawi. These ancient throwers are still used by all dwarf holds across the Karaz Angkor and beyond after all these long years. One of the most renowned of these catapults was perhaps the one named Goblobber a legendary piece of artillery that shone during the terrible goblin wars a long time ago. The catapult would throw living goblins tied firmly against big boulders up in the air and screaming all the way down into the massed blobs of greenskins running toward them. The impact was devastating and crushed many enemies under the massive rock, but it also had a morale effect on their enemies. Many dwarves had the practice of inscribing grudges on the rocks used as ammunition, hence the name Grudge Throwers. This was first done during the legendary War of Vengeance, where dwarf fought elf and elf fought dwarf in a bloody conflict that lasted for ages and costed both parties thousands of lives. Such was the hatred the Dawi had for the elves they were fighting that they started with this practice during those times, and the tradition continues to this day. The dwarves that operate the throwers firmly claim that the engine can only be as good as the grudges that are being thrown, and therefore spend a great deal of time carving their pure anger directly onto the shaped stone ammunition. The dwarves are a proud and warlike folk. Their fury will live forever in the great book of grudges until their enemies have paid in full for their trespasses and aggressions against the dwarves. Having developed many war machines over the centuries and their engineering beyond any other race, the dwarves will continue to develop new ways to crush their foes while the Engineering Guild continues to do its work as diligently as it has through all the time since its inception. The dwarves will surely find a way. <laughs>